Thank you for joining our New Life Bible study entitled The Good News Doctor, taught by Pastor Alan Brooks. The New Testament book of Luke examines in detail the life and ministry of Jesus and is written with the warmth and compassion of a good old-fashioned family doctor. Prepare your hearts and minds for what God has for you personally as Pastor Alan leads us in our study. Good morning, church. How is everybody today? Good. I hope you get better if you're not good yet. The Word of God should do, it, do that to us, shouldn't it? For those of you that don't know, we are a Bible church. And in fact, we're in a series right now that I've entitled The Good News Doctor. And we're working our way through the book of Luke verse by verse. In fact, in the last year, we've made it all the way up to chapter 10. Now, we've had a couple of stops along the way. But if you're not already there, I would encourage you to turn right to chapter 10, oh, before I close it up myself, and let's read together. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not it will return to you and remain in the same house eating and drinking whatever they provide for the laborer deserves his wages do not go from house to house whenever you enter a town and they receive you eat what is set before you heal the sick in it and say to them the kingdom of God has come near to you father we pray this morning that you would enlighten us to your understanding of this word this morning I pray, Father, that I would be your faithful instrument to uh, explain it in a way that's clearly what you intended for us to understand. And Lord, as so oftentimes I pray, I pray that you would help me to decrease so that you may be increased and magnified through this teaching today. And all God's people who are in agreement said, amen. Now, for those of you who were here a few months ago, when we were back in, in Luke chapter 9, I want to point out that there's a difference with what we see with the sending out of this group. Back in chapter 9, in fact, I have that verse on the screen for you. We see in Luke 9, verse 1, it says, He called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Matthew gives us one other piece of understanding on this that's important. He told them, the twelve, to go nowhere among the Gentiles, to enter no town of the Samaritans. So note some of the differences here, first of all. They were sent out, but only to the twelve tribes of Israel. They were not to interact, the original twelve that went out, with any of the Gentiles. That's one of the differences that we see in our passage here in Luke 10 today, is they actually went into some of these Samaritan towns, some of these Gentile villages, they actually went out. And not only that, they weren't just sent out, they were sent ahead. Think about this for a second. What a privilege, what an honor it is that you would be sent out ahead of Jesus and proclaiming to the town, he's coming. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is coming to your town. Years ago, one of the first things that I did in ministry is that I would work with churches in preparation for a crusade that would come to a community. I did them here in Albuquerque, I did them in El Paso, and did them in Tucson. And I would meet with these different churches to talk to them about what we were going to do and how this big event was going to be coming to their community. And very oftentimes, people got excited about what the possibilities of that would be. And that's part of what we're seeing in this passage today, is we're seeing these guys being sent out. Now, some of you, depending on your translation this morning, you might have had it reading differently than the way I read it. For those of you that don't know, I teach out of the English Standard Version. 
And in English Standard, they've chose to translate the word as 72 disciples that were sent out. Some of you have what? Help me. Some of you have 70. I personally prefer 70. There's equally divided opinion on this, good argument on both sides of it. But the reason that I like 70 personally is 70 is a very popular number in the Bible. For those of you that don't know, when Moses was out in the wilderness, he needed some help. And so what the Lord instructed him to do was to appoint how many? 70 elders to help him with these millions of people that were out there in the wilderness with him. In addition, you see that Gideon had 70 sons. Boy, that guy kept busy, did he not? And some of you women, it, it wasn't the same wife, just so you know. That, that would be pretty crazy, I guess. But we also know that Daniel, he had a very popular prophecy that dealt with 70 weeks. So 70 is a very popular number. But here's the reason I like 70 the best for the translation. In Genesis 10, there's a listing of the nations. And the listing of those nations back then that encompassed the known world was 70. And it would seem that Luke, as the spokesman, the gospel for the nations, would certainly be using an analogy like that. And just to add to this, if you don't know, Luke is the only person that tells us about the 70 being sent out. But notice this, the 70 are sent out with some special instructions. They're told to go in pairs, what I like to call Noah's Ark style, okay? They were going two by two out to these various villages. Now, ask yourself this question, why was that? On a very practical level, there's accountability when there's two people. Even beyond that, there's encouragement. No matter what it is, it's almost always more enjoyable to do it with somebody else. The other thing on a practical level with this I think that's important is that it allowed them to spread out. They didn't mob a single village. You know, these 70 didn't descend upon one single town all at one time. In fact, if you divide it out, they could have easily got to 35 villages all at the same time. Notice well it says that they're to greet no one. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I kind of have that small town mentality, and, and I like it like on rural roads when the person that you're passing, they wave at you. I mean, you do that in the city, somebody might actually shoot you. It's a little bit different, I, I realize. But, but, but I like that idea of greeting, you know, people as you're passing by, you know, on the road. Now, why did Jesus not want them to even greet anybody on the road? On a very practical level, we need to understand our form of greeting is very different than the ancient world. And they could have very easily got distracted because greetings as well as goodbyes were very protracted. They went on and on. And he's saying, no, you don't have enough time for that. You just need to keep focused and keep your eyes straight ahead and go to the village that you're supposed to go to. The other thing that's a biggie, I think, here is he tells them to take nothing. No money. And having no money meant what? They couldn't buy any food. They couldn't pay for, pay for a place to stay. They were to take no supplies. In fact, it says to take no sandals. Again, here, opinions divided on this. One opinion says, well, they would have an extra pair. It's kind of like when I go backpacking. You know, I like to take my hiking boots off when I get to the campsite, and I have a pair of sandals that I carry just so my feet can kind of, you know, relax from having been in the boots. But it's very possible that what Jesus intended in this passage is for them to go out entirely impoverished. Because one of the greatest elements of being poor was not even having shoes on your feet. I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute about why I think that that view can be supported. But also notice that he sent them out as lambs, not sheep. You recognize the difference, right? A lamb is a young sheep. And young lambs are very dependent upon others to protect and care for them, are they not? And see, all this stuff ties together. One of the things that having no money, having no supplies, having no clothes does for you is it definitely gets you to bend your knee a lot, does it? 
And that's in fact what he encourages them to do. He encourages that they would pray for more laborers, people to help with the harvest that he's desiring to be brought in. Years ago, as many of you know, I used to be a, a children's pastor. And as a children's pastor, this particular verse was one of our theme verses because the harvest was plentiful. I mean, we had thousands of kids that would descend upon our church every weekend. And it took a minimum of over 300 adult volunteers to help staff that particular program. And so we were constantly, you know, in need of people to come help with that harvest. We brought in a speaker one time, and he got our leaders together, and I'll never forget this, and he started sharing some recruiting tips, different things they used at his church to stir up laborers for the harvest and kids' ministry. And I remember looking around the room, and all of our children's leaders just kind of had this dumbfounded look on their face, and he finally stopped himself and said, so I'm, I'm telling this isn't ringing with you guys. What do you guys do here? And somebody raised their hand and says, well, Pastor Allen tells us we should just pray. Because you know that's what we did. We prayed that the Lord would send out laborers into the harvest. And certainly we believed that it was biblical. In fact, let me share an example of that. At times we would do campaigns where we would ask all of our existing workers to just take a time of prayer and pray that God would give them the name of someone that they knew who maybe would be interested in coming to serve with us. And then what they were supposed to do once we had that name is bring it to the office and usually what I would do is I would call that person. And so I would pick up the phone and call that individual and say, Joe, you don't know me, but I'm a friend of a friend of yours. And we've been praying about people that would come help with our ministry. And your friend had your name laid upon their heart. Now some of you are thinking, oh, wow, there you go. look, there goes the guilt trip, right? You lay that down. But I always followed it up with this. I said, what we want you to do is we want you to pray for confirmation. I kid you not, nine times out of ten when I told people that, you know what they told me? I don't even have to pray about it. Your call is confirmation from God. Because I've already prayed about what God would have me be doing, and the very fact that you called me, that's confirmation in itself. It's absolutely powerful when we recognize that when we go to our Heavenly Father, when we have a need and we don't have the resources, that He has all of them. There's nothing that He doesn't have. Now, as we move into this a little further, we see that if the ambassadors that Jesus sent out were received and helped, it really was win-win. The ambassadors got the food and the lodging that they needed, right? But notice as well, whoever supported their ministry in that town it said that they were to speak this phrase to them, peace be to this house. Now, it wasn't simply a greeting. It wasn't like them saying shalom. It was the idea that they were receiving a gift. In fact, in John 14, 27, it says, the peace I give, this is Jesus speaking, is a gift the world cannot give. In other words, there was a favor that was there placed upon that home because that home it chose to support the ministry that these ambassadors were doing. Not only that, we see that in the town the sick were healed. We also see that the kingdom of God was proclaimed. And I think there's some good lessons for us in here today. First of all, don't do ministry alone. The reality is that Christianity is a team sport. There is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. In fact, the reason for it, again, is because of what we've talked about. What did these guys have going out into the field? They had accountability. They had encouragement from other people to, you know, shore them up when what their message was wasn't received quite so well. In fact, if you think about even the Lone Ranger, he had what? He had Tonto, right? I know I'm dating myself there. I'll go look it up on YouTube or something, okay? I think another lesson for us to learn is to be more dependent on God. Can I show, see a show of hands? How many of you really need to do more of that, be more dependent on God? All of us need to be more dependent on God. One of the challenges that I think we have in our world, specifically the American culture, 
is we have access to so many resources. And because we have the resources, we tend to not rely or be as dependent upon God. It's when those resources are stripped away from you that you spend a lot more time in prayer, that you spend a lot more time in God's Word, right? And by the way, church, I believe there is a time coming for us in the future when we're going to learn to be more dependent upon God. And so why not be getting ready for that now and planning for that now? Also think about this. Who would not want you to be more dependent on God? The devil, of course. The devil wants you to be a self-made person, a self-sustained person, someone who can take care of his own because he's got the gifts or he's got the resources. I love that this great dependence showed these guys being sent out the need they had for praying more. I remember when I left the security of a large church job and decided that the Lord had called me to start this church about five and a half years ago, I can assure you that I did a lot of praying because there was a lot of uncertainty about what would happen with that. And it's been exciting to see it take place, but the reality is it's been depending upon his resources, not my own. And there's a great truth, I think, that we all learn in that. I have a question for you this morning. Would you like to be more blessed? I think most of us would. One of the ways that you can be more blessed personally is that if you would go out and find ways that you can better support either through your time, your talents, or your treasures, the things that God's trying to do. So if God's working through an organization like a church or a group or an individual, finding ways that you can help to support that, I know from a personal experience that will be a blessing back to you as well. I think most of us have had the experience of giving and how that blessing comes back to us. But I'll never forget a time that I had a vehicle that I really needed to get rid of and a Christian brother decided he would help me and he put it on consignment on his lot. And while I was there with him that day, because this was something special he was doing for me to just kind of help out in the situation, I said, so hey, how are things going for you? And he said, well, to be honest with you, he says the business is really doing bad. And he says, it looks like I may even have to close up shop. And I said, well, would you mind if I prayed for you? And so I did, and I prayed that God would bless him, that God would uh, show his favor in this man's life. Well, it wasn't but a few days later, he called me back and said, hey, we sold your truck. And I said, wow, praise God, that's awesome. And when I went over there to collect the check from what he had made selling the truck, you know, I was actually headed back out into my vehicle, and he came running out. He said, hey, Alan, Alan, I've got to tell you something real quick. Because about a month had gone by by the time I had got there for that check. He said, we just closed the best month in the history of our business. I just want you to know how God answered your prayer in a major way. And I've discovered that a lot, that when we come alongside what God does, God blesses us as well as blessing the people who are doing the work. Let's go back into our passage here and go down to verse 10. Because Jesus also tells them how to deal with people that don't receive that message. He says, whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to your feet, we wipe off against you. Nonetheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for your town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears me and the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Can you imagine what that was like? I mean, these ambassadors, when they were not received, would go to the main streets of the town and proclaim God's judgment upon them. 
In fact, that's this idea of we wipe every memory of you. The dust literally on our feet, we're wiping it off. But note this, even in those cases, they were told to let them know that the kingdom of God was coming near. I would encourage you as you look at this that maybe that might not be your method of evangelism. Because certainly this was a special case. But there is something even practical I think we can learn from it, is there not? We need to recognize partly what Jesus told them. When people reject our message about Jesus, they aren't necessarily rejecting us. So we shouldn't take it personally. Ultimately, they are rejecting Him. They're rejecting God. And you know, that's a pretty big deal. In fact, in this passage, we see that the judgment for rejecting him is greater than the judgment for the homosexuality of Sodom. It's greater than the judgment for the materialism of Tyre and Sidon. And think about that for a minute. Why is the sin of unbelief so much more damnable, so much more punishable by God than all those other sins? It is the ultimate sin. In fact, I think you can say safely that it is the unforgivable sin. Because if somebody refuses to believe, God can't forgive that. And so it's a big deal when people turn their back on God. The other thing I would share with you is that when there's no risk, there's no reward. You know, a lot of times in life, we don't risk rejection. And life's filled with opportunities for rejection. Growing up as kids, you know, we try out for a team or something. There's the opportunity for rejection. We ask a person out, you know, a person of the opposite sex. There's an opportunity for rejection. We get a little bit older. We put out there an application for a job. There's the opportunity for rejection. Maybe we even ask somebody to marry us. And there's that vulnerability, that possibility, they might what? Reject us. You know, the easy way out of that is just to avoid taking the risk, right? Don't take a chance at it. I love the story of the little boy who has seen this other girl in class, and he's really fond of her, and so he decides he's going to write her a note, and he gives the note to his best friend. He says, hey, would you give this, you know, to the little girl? And so the best friend does what a good best friend does, and he gives the note to the little girl. Well, the little girl reads the note, and the note says, I really like you a lot. Do you like me? And the little girl looked back to the best friend and goes, yeah, I do. (laughs) That's the problem with sending a messenger sometimes. They see it as the messenger. But still, we've got to be willing to offer that possibility of rejection if we're going to share Christ with people, right? Right? Because otherwise, who's going to hear about the great reward of Christ if we don't share? Let's go back to verse 17, and let's kind of finish this passage out this morning. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nonetheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he, speaking of Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So here we have the 70 returned. Remember I said earlier, one of the reasons that I think Jesus sent them out without any sandals at all is this reference to the fact that they were able to tread over the top of scorpions. 
By the way, I would not suggest doing that. I've heard churches every once in a while that try to apply some of these Bible promises. It doesn't work so well if that's not specifically what God's given you the power to do. But the 70 return and they're rejoicing in the victories, especially the victories they've had over the spiritual powers of darkness. And then notice Jesus' response. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, there's different interpretations to this, but I think it's safe to say that their ministry got Satan's attention. You know, oftentimes when I've encouraged people to start serving in ministry, they'll come back to me, you know, a few weeks later and go, wow, everything's falling apart in my life. I mean, all kinds of things are going on. And I would try to encourage them, that's a good sign. But it does seem counterintuitive, doesn't it? Wow, I've given my life to serving God and giving my best to Him, and look at all these things that are starting to go wrong in my life. But why is that? We've gotten His attention. He says, you want to get off the bench, and you want to go play in the game? Well, then let's have some fun. And then that's when the attacks begin. The reason some of us don't ever get attacked is why bother? We're not adding anything to the game. It's when we get out on the field and we engage in that spiritual battle like these disciples were that that's going to get the attention of the enemy camp. And do not be deceived, he will come after you. But again, that's a what? That's a good thing. I know it's counterintuitive, but it is a good thing. But I love what Jesus says here. He says, as great as those spiritual victories were, even greater is the victory that their citizenship is in heaven. In fact, in Revelation 20, it speaks of this book of life. And John writing here says, I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And they were all judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Note the distinction. Those whose names are written in heaven, written in the book of life, unlike those whose names aren't there, they aren't judged according to their deeds. They're judged according to Christ's deed. Because of what Christ did, his finished work on the cross, those of us who have our name written in the book of life because we put our faith and trust in that, we won't stand before God to be judged for our deeds. But those whose name's not in that book of life, then you stand accountable for those deeds. Now, I don't know about you, but I got a lot of skeletons in my closet, okay? And I'd sure hate to stand before the living God and have to make an account for those things. But thanks be to Jesus, I don't have to. Because I'm covered by the blood of Christ personally, I'm not judged by my deeds. I'm judged by His. And what a great truth that is for every one of us that know Him. We also see in this passage a very rare recorded conversation between Jesus and the Father. And I'll read it to you again. It says, I thank you, Father, that the Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Don't miss his point here. His point is that you don't need education, you don't need intelligence in order to believe. In fact, if anything, education and intelligence oftentimes does what? It interferes. We coined a phrase years ago with some people that we knew, and we used to call them educated beyond their intelligence. And you know, sometimes I'm a pretty well-educated person myself, but the reality is a lot of times because we think we know so much, we lose that simple childlike faith that's what it takes to believe. Even a child can put their faith in Jesus. 
They don't need any education. They don't need any intelligence. They can simply believe because of what they see revealed about God. Luke 18, verse 17, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So let me ask you this morning, do you, do you have that childlike faith? Maybe a better question. Is your name written in that book of life? Because my hope is if for whatever reason you don't think it would be before you left today, you can get it wrote in there. By the way, you don't write it in yourself. It doesn't work like that, okay? What you have to choose today is that you're going to believe. What is it that you're going to believe? You're going to believe that, first of all, you have a problem apart from Jesus. And that problem apart from Jesus is called sin. It's a willful disregard for the thing of God, the things of God. And what you've got to decide is that the only cure to your disease, the only answer to your problem, is found in this one named Jesus, the Son of God who came to this earth and gave his life in your place and in mine. And his deed covers all of our bad deeds, his good deed. Isn't there a great truth and beauty in that? That's what it takes to get your name wrote into the book of life. You just have to decide not unlike a child would have to decide. I believe. I want to believe. For the rest of us who've already made that decision, we need to recognize that we have that same honor and privilege that that first group of people did. They were sent ahead, were they not? They were sent ahead to prepare the way for the fact that Jesus was coming to their town. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we are now, those who are new creations in Christ, we are now his ambassadors. And we're being sent ahead for what purpose? We're being sent ahead to tell them that the King of Kings is coming again. As you've heard me say here before, the second coming of Christ is discussed more in Scripture than the first one was. And what a great privilege and honor you and I have. How are you fulfilling that today? If you're not and you really don't know how, I would encourage you to talk to one of us before you leave today and say, I, I'm not fulfilling that mission that I believe God's given me to be as an ambassador. How can I do that? What is it that I need to learn in order to be who God's called me to be? Let me ask you a question. If you learn that, do you think there'll be a blessing that comes with that? Of course you know the answer is yes. Would you stand and let's close in prayer? This morning, after we pray, if you're somebody who would like to put your faith and trust in Christ, we have people that would like to pray with you about that decision. And right outside this door into our front foyer over here to my left, to your right, will be an opportunity to pray with some of our counselors about that. If you're one of those other people that I was talking about, you've been around the church for a while, and, and believe me, that's a lot of folks, that's a lot of us. They've been around the church for a while and haven't fully embraced the reality that God's given them a mission. And that mission is to go make disciples, to be his ambassador. If you want to know how to do that this morning, you can also get prayer for that this morning as well. Some of the rest of you are hurting. There's stuff going on in your life that's pretty challenging for you. It could be your health, it could be your finances could be a relationship. If we learned anything this morning, we've learned that we need to become dependent upon God. And we have people that want to pray with you and help you become more dependent in that way. Amen? Well, Father, we close out this time together and we pray, Father, that you've spoken to our lives. Not just our minds, Lord, but our hearts. And I pray, Lord God, that you would change our hearts. Help us to recognize, as these disciples did, when we have nothing, we can become totally dependent upon you. Forgive me, Father. Forgive us for the way that so oftentimes we rely on our own resources. And because you've blessed us and given us favor in so many different ways, a lot of times we aren't on our knees the way we ought to be and seeking to be more dependent upon you. 
And Lord, we embrace that this morning. We ask that you would grow us in that. You would grow our faith. You would grow our dependence. And we pray, Lord, as well, that today would be a day of salvation. We pray that there's somebody who's heard this message today that recognizes their name's not yet written in the book of life, but they want it to be. And may today be that day. And all God's people prayed and said, Amen. Let's worship some more.